Welcome everybody, my name is Diane Silva and I'm the Director of Philanthropy at London Community Foundation. I'm really happy to be here with all of you tonight and it's actually awesome to see a great group of people. The room is full and we've been really pleased with uh, this being the last of our uh, four-part speaker series that these sessions have been well attended. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have attended our speaker series in the past? If you could just show a, some hands. Beautiful, that's really nice. So we're happy to see this. Uh, so before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the, uh, the land on which we gather, which is the traditional territory, and I do apologize if I'm not pronouncing the names properly. Uh, Anish Nabek, Hodenane, Hodenashone, and Lenape. Beautiful, thank you. See, that's so bad that I didn't get that. <laughs> um, Okay, and thank you very much for all of you being here. Uh, as many of you know, London Community Foundation is proud to bring the witness blanket to our community. Uh, this was very important to us, and we were excited when the Canada 150 fund, uh, that funding opportunity came to us and our donors stepped in uh, to provide the funding to bring the blanket and to fund a few other major projects in our community in honor of Canada 150. Um, so we're very excited to do this. And with the witness blanket, of course, there's a lot of meaning behind it around the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And this is our part to try to educate the community and the public uh, to open up their minds and their hearts and get a deeper and better understanding of uh, the dark part of our Canadian history. And so uh, we hope that a lot of you have learned through the four-part uh, speaker series, and we're really excited about today's talk, which will be a fireside chat. And we have two fabulous speakers. We have Margaret Buist, uh, who is the Indigenous and Northern Affairs, who's with Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada, and Al Day, uh, who is with Namrid Friendship Centre, and they're both gonna discuss what reconciliation means from a local and national perspective. Um, I'm going to read to you their biographies. So Margaret Buist, for those of you who don't know, Margaret was born in London, Ontario, and lived here for 40 years before moving to Ottawa. In London, Margaret had her own law firm where she specialized in equality rights and representing women who experienced abuse. In 2002, Margaret moved to Ottawa with her partner, Leslie Remu, am I? No. Riome. Uh, there she began work for federal government, first for the Department of Justice and now for Indigenous and Northern Affairs. Margaret chose to devote her career as a public servant to working with and for Indigenous people. Last year, Margaret won a Public Service Award for Excellence for her work leading, with, uh, leading the meetings with families and, lo uh, and loved and survivors to design the inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. She is currently working with First Nation partners to reform the child welfare system. Al, so please welcome Margaret. <laughs> and our next speaker is Al Day. Al is, is of the Anawal Turtle Clan, and his Oneida name is Lutnawit. Did I? I did. See, I didn't say that right, and I knew I didn't. I apologize. Currently, he sits as a Shinoshines. Shinosis, uh, one of nine traditional chiefs of the Oneida. Le, oh my goodness, I'm really going to be butchering this, and I feel horrible. Onidaga Lorenaso. Okay, beautiful. Uh, he has been married to his partner, Laurel, for 49 years, and is the father of Paul and Brian, and has resided at the Oneida settlement since birth. Al retired in 2007 and is currently employed at the, as an executive director at the, at the Namrid Friendship Center and has been in this position since August of 2011. Al has been an involved member of the United Community in sports and community service organizations, including 39 years in formal leadership positions. He has represented Oneida and Namrid on numerous boards and agencies. Al was instrumental in the establishment of a number of regional and local organizations whose goals are to contribute to the well being of Indigenous peoples. He has served as a policy and uh, analyst for the Indigenous organizations in the United States and Canada, and has participated in negotiations with the federal, provincial, and state governments in both Canada and the United States. And we're also uh, proud to say that he's also a member of our grants committee at the Community Foundation. So please welcome Al. <laughs> So the format for tonight's uh, session will be 
fluid conversation, and we do want questions from the audience. So if anyone does want to ask the speakers a question, just put your hand up and I will pass the microphone so everyone has a chance to hear the questions, okay? And we'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much, and I also would like to, <clears throat> excuse me, acknowledge the traditional territory that we're on here at the Forks of the Thames of the Anishinaabek and Haudenosaunee and Lenape people. And you may ask yourselves why I just said that and why we gave that acknowledgement. Well, tonight's theme is reconciliation, and it's an act of reconciliation to know about the land that you are occupying here in London and that we all live in, uh, I no longer, uh, and I do miss it, but um, that this is the land of people who precede us, um, who are settlers, and I include myself amongst that. So it's very important to understand the history and to know that there are people who lived here for centuries before um, we created the city of London. <clears throat> I'm very, very honored to be here tonight and want to thank the London Community Foundation for inviting me. I'm also, a, a, it's a real privilege to me to share the stage tonight with Al. I've just uh, met Al, but I've listened, talked with him for a few minutes and I've listened to his biography and uh, um, he's a very impressive um, um, person and I'm really honored to be here. So I'm looking forward to tonight's discussion and I want to just make a few opening remarks and I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the work that's happening at the federal government level and in Indigenous Northern Affairs and other departments in the federal government. And I also want to talk to you just a little bit about my own personal journey um, with respect to reconciliation. So a couple of years ago when the Trudeau government was elected, um, <clears throat> things really changed in Ottawa. And I'd like to talk about some of the big picture changes that are, that are occurring across this country right now. Um, and I'm speaking now as an employee of INAC, and a little later I'll speak of my own personal experience, but I, I'm just trying to make a distinguish, distinguish the two. Um, first of all, so I don't get fired, and, um, and, <laughs> and second of all, because they are different uh, stories. But um, INAC now has come alive. We have a clear political mandate as public servants to actively work on reconciliation with the Indigenous peoples in this country. And what does that mean? Well, let me give you some big picture examples. Uh, for example, um, a group of cabinet ministers are meeting twice a week to review all of our laws and policies to ensure that they comply with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, the Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Action, um, and that committee is led by Canada's first Indigenous Justice Minister, uh, Minister Wilson Raybould. That's a remarkable sea change in Ottawa. Um, Canada is also working really hard with Indigenous people to figure out how to implement the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which is an international instrument that for many, many years was not recognized as having any effect in this country. And we have fully embraced it and are accepting it and working with Indigenous partners to figure out what that means in terms of Canadian laws and, and policy making. There's a wholesale review of the uh, environmental protection laws in this country. Under the Harper government, those laws were changed uh, quite considerably, especially around navigable waters and fish. Um, and there's a whole review and it is uh, really being designed alongside Indigenous people and including them in the decision making about what should happen. Um, with environmental and climate change. There are a number of exploratory tables that have been set up, negotiation tables that have been set up across the country to talk about what self-government and self-determination looks like for uh, individual communities and large um, tribal groups. The government launched the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. And you will have heard a lot of media in the last little while, which is deeply critical of the inquiry. Um, I still hold a lot of faith in the ability of that inquiry to do justice to the families and loved ones and survivors, and we'll see how that plays out. It's very hard to run an inquiry. It is the first ever national inquiry. That means that every province and territory has signed on. Never happened before um, in this country. 
Um, INAC itself is reforming our education and social programs uh, alongside Indigenous people and listening very intently as to what's being asked for and needed by Indigenous people as we do this reform. So that's some of the things that are happening on the national level. And now I'll, I'll turn a bit more to the, the personal. And I won't take long, Al. I'll give you lots of time, I promise. Um, and so um, I've had a, a remarkable experience when working for the federal government as a public servant, um, sitting side by side with First Nations. Two years ago, I was asked to lead the federal government team that designed in partnership with First Nations, designed the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. And we did that by taking three cabinet ministers, Indigenous Affairs Minister Bennett, the Minister of Justice Jody Wilson-Raybould, and the Minister of the Status of Women, Patty Haidu, into communities to sit in a room with two and 300 um, survivors of violence, uh, the families and loved ones who had lost um, um, a woman or a child uh, to, uh, to violence, and we listened to them and how they wanted to see the inquiry unfold. They'd been calling for this inquiry for a, over a decade, and so it, um, the government chose to start by listening to them. And the three cabinet ministers, also never been done before, sat in 18 face-to-face -face meetings. We met over 2,000 people, and we heard from them directly as to how they wanted to see uh, the inquiry. In my mind, that very act of listening and respecting and honoring and designing a process together is an act of reconciliation. This year I'm leading a team who's uh, working across the country with First Nation partners on how to figure out how to change the child welfare system as it relates to First Nations children. The rates of taking children in, First Nation children into care are extremely high. You've probably heard about the 60 scoop. Well, um, there are still problems. The system is broken. Uh, children are being taken from their families, taken from their communities. They're losing their language, their culture, their connection to community and to their parents, and that has to stop. And so we're working with all of the provinces and uh, Yukon. Uh, we don't tr provide services in the two territories, Nunavut and Northwest Territory, that have been devolved. But we're working with all of those people and we're working with First Nations across the country to figure out what would, what would a new system look like? What would it look like to actually have a system that dealt with the issues, the underlying causes of why children are going into care, that fostered community well-being, and that helped families keep their children with them and not take them out of community. That to me also is an act of reconciliation. The fact that we in the government as public servants are listening, we're working in partnership to find solutions, we're identifying jointly shared outcomes of the work that we're doing in terms of creating policy and law, that is reconciliation. Um, and those are some of the things that, that we as public servants are doing in partnership. So I've been in government now for 15 years and I've had amazing experiences when working with and for Indigenous people. I've worked in small communities in the Northwest Territories. I've flown into remote communities in Northern Ontario. I visited BC, a BC reserve that has a winery and a golf course on it. And I've spent time with uh, Inuit on Baffin Island. <clears throat> and what I've observed um, as a settler and as an outsider, but who has been warmly uh, welcomed into communities, is the diversity and the strength and the generosity of Indigenous people in this land. <clears throat> Excuse me, my throat is dry. It is very hot here in London. I'm much used, to, I'm more used to the cooler climate in Ottawa now. Yes, my first winter that I moved there from London, it was minus 45 and I thought I had died. <clears throat> you know, there are many reasons why uh, Indigenous people in this country have survived. 
the atrocities that were inflicted upon them by the settlers. I've learned about the vital connection that we humans have with our land and our water and how important it is to protect them from Indigenous people. I've learned about the importance of the connection to family, to community, and the need to preserve language and culture and to remember history and to preserve that history. I've learned to respect my elders, something that I didn't do before I worked with Indigenous people. But I learned to respect my elders and seek their wisdom and to honor them. I could go on and on and on, <clears throat> but what I'm trying to say is that listening and learning and uh, demonstrating respect and having the good fortune to spend time uh, with Indigenous people is reconciliation. Thank you. So if I, I suppose if I was going to say ditto, you'd be disappointed. Sigulis Goeg, Londa Hawit Yungat, Ahno Wald, Niwaki Deloda. Um, what I uh, said was, hello everyone, um, uh, my name is uh, Loda Witt, and it translates depending on who you talk to and how you say it, uh, either that light uh, that's in the sky before, uh, before the sun comes up, or it also, I've been told it means uh, he, who, he who brings the light, so I'm not sure which one it is. I'm Turtle Clan, and I'm a member of the Oneida Nation. Um, I was thinking about this uh, off and on for the last few days and today as well, amongst other, uh, other things I'm doing at the, at the center. And I thought I could take this in a lot of different ways. Uh, you know, I could talk uh, a lot about the, uh, uh, the things that have uh, been inflicted upon our people, and I could talk about uh, some of the uh, things that are still going on. Um, and uh, despite what uh, Margaret said, uh, it's not all uh, uh, peaches and cream out there. Uh, but I think what I wanted to start with was uh, I, I had the opportunity to uh, be at the, uh, the uh, Central Public Library back in November 25th. And the uh, province had uh, uh, asked uh, Minister Kotu, provincial minister, to take the lead in uh, going across the province and uh, conducting uh, these uh, uh, systemic racism forums. Uh, so uh, Michael was there, Michael Coutu, and uh, Deb Matthews, and the mayor, and uh, a few other folks. So this, uh, this uh, black gentleman had invited me to, uh, to go, and I wasn't, I wasn't going to go. Uh, I, uh, it seems to me that uh, a lot of these things, there's uh, lots of flash and dash, but there's, no, there's nothing happens after. So I thought, well, he, so anyway, he talks me into it. So I wasn't going to say anything. And after I listened to a couple of speakers, I got up and I said, you know, you're talking about systemic racism. I said, what you need to understand, the first thing you need to understand and what you all need to understand here tonight is Canada was founded on racism. It's called Doctrine of Discovery. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard that before, and I won't bore you with a lot of the detail, but it's the foundation of Can Canada's laws. And simply put, it was established um, in Europe in the, in the Middle Ages. And uh, the dictate was to all your Christian nations in Europe, there's lots of wealth to be gathered and, and, and throughout the world. Uh, go out and bring that wealth back, make sure we're, we're okay with it. And by the way, there are some folks there that live there. Uh, they're not Christians. They don't have the capacity to own land. Um, <clears throat> they're, not, they're not humans. They're savages. So take the land, plant the flag in the ground, and do what you gotta do with them. And that's what Canada was founded on, this doctrine of discovery, and so is the United States. Um, in both those countries, there are 2,600 different references in, in legal and case law that refer to Doctor of Discovery, and the the um, the rationale uh, that the the various uh, court systems have used to find against Indigenous people, whether it be United States or Canada, is essentially one that states very clearly: uh, we are right, you are wrong. We have the authority. 
we've taken your land, too bad. That's a real quick summary, but that's essentially what it is. So, I remember uh, when Julian Fantino was the, the city police chief, he and I had some, uh, had one discussion, and it was uh, uh, an interesting discussion. Uh, uh, certainly we didn't agree. Uh, so Mr. Fantino said to me, he said, you know what we need? He said, we need more brown faces and, and, uh, and the police uniforms in London. And I asked him, I said, whose law are they going to enforce? Whose law are they going to enforce? And that's my point here, is Truth and Reconciliation talks about reconciliation. I've also, you go on the website in Canada, slash Indian Affairs talks about nation to nation. Well, they define who a nation is. They define what a nation is. Uh, they define that the nations that they're going to deal with are represented by band councils who are uh, formed as a result of Indian Act legislation. So what they do is they establish the rules beforehand. They then sit down and they say, we're going to talk to you and we'll negotiate with you. But guess what? They only agree to what they want to agree to. They will not go the extra mile. I've been involved with, uh, I think there was somebody said, uh, she was reading a bit about my bio. I've been involved with uh, senior level negotiations. Uh, last one I was involved with was 1996. I was representing all of the communities in Ontario, 133. And I was negotiating funny arrangements um, for those communities. And I was co-chairing the process, and the, the co-chair was a uh, guy out of headquarters, I don't remember his name. But he made it very fundamentally clear at the beginning of the discussion that uh, there were some things that weren't on. There were some things that we couldn't go. We could only deal with some of the technical processes. Uh, in the end, it was very much a, a, a top-down approach. Either I accepted it on behalf of the communities, or we didn't have an agreement. So then once, I, once we reached an agreement, which was, again, whatever you want to cite it, my responsibility was to go out to the communities and explain to them, oh, here's what we've negotiated, here's what you have. And the best I could tell them was, we did the best we could. We've set it up in a couple instances where you can create scenarios where you can try to justify where you should get some more money. And that's all we, that's all we were able to achieve. So. You know, there's, there's lots of forums and things going on, as, as Margaret suggested. Uh, but I want to bring to your attention uh, Cindy Blackstock. Cindy and her uh, organization filed a complaint with the Human Rights Commission, I believe it's called, uh, in 1997. And they were concerned about the treatment of indigenous children. And they were concerned about what was going on. So they filed a suit, and guess what? CSIS, RCMP, other government officials started following her, started bugging her phones, started uh, making sure that they knew every move she made. Anyway, the tribunal has found, found against Canada once, twice, three times. Most recently, about three weeks ago, the government announced they're going to go back to court and they're going to try and fight it again because they don't want justice for Indigenous children only on their own terms. I don't know if you've heard of Jordan's Principle. That's another example. You know, this uh, young fella, little baby, actually, the guy dies because there's jurisdiction issue between the province and, the, and the, the federal government. That case goes forward, uh, complaints goes forward, and they find, they hold that there should, there should be a clear elimination of roadblocks, jurisdiction roadblocks, so that no indigenous child is going to be found wanting when it comes to health or social or, or benefits or anything like that. Um, repeatedly, Canada ignores those kinds of things. They ignore their own processes. They ignore their own tribunals when it suits them. When it suits them that they will negotiate self-government arrangements on their terms, they'll enter those into them gladly. Uh, it amuses me when I hear that they're talking about child welfare. You know, the 60s scoop never ended. 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, it's still going on. Uh, most recently, uh, in the last couple of years, one of our staff had to go over to uh, Victoria Hospital on, on um, Commissioner's Road. His young indigenous mother from Oneida goes in there and she's going to give birth. Uh, they do an intake on her and uh, the nurse uh, decided that 
she wasn't going to be a fit mother. And uh, I don't know what, what, how she made that determination. She called CAS up. CAS was going to see the child at birth. My staff went over there and stopped her. That's not an isolated incident. I know of at least two other instances in the last couple of years where uh, grandma has come in from one of our nearby communities and stopped that. So uh, I recently had a meeting with, uh, uh, a lengthy meeting with the local executive director of the Child and Family Services. It seems like uh, the meeting was okay. You know, there's a lot of good dialogue, but the proof is going to be in a pudding. You know, are we going to actually reach agreement on something that's meaningful? Or are we just going to get words? So for me, truth and reconciliation, or you know, the reconciliation they're talking about, is there going to be a sea change where we're equal parties sitting at the table? Or is it going to be one where one party is dictating to the other? And I don't know, Mr. Raybould, uh, uh, is that her name? Wilson, Wilson Ray. I don't know her, but I know her father. I don't know him really well, but uh, Bill was a... Uh, uh, really outspoken guy, and uh, I'm sure he's proud of his daughter. Uh, on the other hand, uh, having Bill Hurt speak uh, a few times, uh, I'm not sure what he'd say about uh, what's going on. Last uh, April, a year ago, uh, Minister, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau stated that they were going to fully implement the United Nations Indigenous Rights, uh, UDRIP, I guess they call it. They're going to fully implement it. Two months later, and uh, at some kind of UN forum in New York City, uh, I'm not sure if it was Bennett or uh, Robolt Wilson stated that, uh, well, they're not going to implement it. They're going to study it and they examine it and they're figure out how they can uh, maybe put something in place. So, yeah, you know, there's lots of, lots of good words, lots of good things being stated. But the reality is it's not really happening. And so if you go back to the Doctrine of Discovery, it was all about getting us to submit to them. It was all about taking our land. And make no mistake, that's what it was all about, was taking our land. That's what it was all about. Absolutely. Um, the, um, uh, you know, at various times, uh, uh, you'll hear the uh, uh, different different parties, uh, maybe some of the media play up the, the issue about how much money is getting voted by appropriated by parliament uh, for quote unquote indigenous uh, issues or matters or agencies and so on. What they never talk about is how much money is on trust and trust funds that are held on behalf of the 633 communities in Canada. You never hear about that. How many millions of millions of dollars are being held in trust on behalf of those First Nations. And the only way you can access those monies, you have to put a brand council resolution. They may have changed now, Mark, will correct me if I'm wrong, but the way it used to be, you'd have to put a brand council resolution in, asking for your own money, and you had to justify what you were going to do with it, and then they'd say yes or no. So recently I read a report, I talked about uh, the actual appropriations that are voted on by Parliament uh, is actually a drop in a bucket if you, if you compare it to the actual money that's owed in trust account monies. And, and uh, they actually, uh, I think they pay something uh, less than prime on return. So, so again, it's, it's, it's all about, uh, it's all about, it's always been about land. And most people don't know this, in 1846, there was a significant debate that went inside of, uh, at that time, the forerunner of the Canadian government. And the debate was twofold. Should we get rid of them all, or should we Christianize them? That was the debate that occurred. Prior to that, the group that was developing our ministering policy with respect to indigenous people was the Department of War. Up until 1846, there was value to have indigenous warriors fighting for Canada. 1846, that changed. So the bureaucrats that took over had this internal discussion. Should we kill them all, or should we Christianize them? They decided to Christianize us. So in 1852, legislation's passed. It's called the Gradual Civilizations Act. 1858, another act is passed, which is meant to deal with Indian lands. It's gonna, it's gonna find a way to deal with Indian lands. In 1874, I believe it was, the Indian Act has passed. And uh, I've never been a student of the Indian Act. I'm not a big fan of it by any means. 
But essentially, the Indian Act and all the policies that were administered and interpreted on behalf of the government by various Indian agents, uh, it virtually controls every aspect of an indigenous person's life. Now, they backed off a little bit because the press starts to ask questions. Uh, I always thought this only happened out west. But I was asking one of the elders on Oneida, I said, did you ever have to go to the Indian agent and get permission to leave our community? He said, yeah. Uh, he said, to, we used to mostly, most people didn't have cars, so we, we walked over to the Indian agent and four or five miles, said, can I go into town? And the agent, Indian agent either, said, yes or no. He said, yes. He put a little tag on you and pinned it on your coat or your shirt. And at that point, uh, most of our people used to go to St. Thomas because of the rail spur. So you'd, they'd be walking around in St. Thomas, and the police would look at them and uh, see if they had a little tag. If they had a tag, they were free to go. If they didn't have a tag, they got arrested and got driven back to the community. Again, I, I, was, I was a bit shocked when I found out that because I, 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 I was never told that in my community. But that was uh, some of the stuff that, that went on. So, so you know, so to me, the residential school syndrome, you know, that, you know, that uh, they started in 18, uh, 17, 1789, I think, I believe it was the first one. To my surprise, the last one was closed in 1996. Um, and um, it's, um, it, you know, the witness blanket, I don't know if you had a chance to read or not, but on that door, I was reading it before I came down, there's, uh, there's a, this, uh, this person is writing, it might have been uh, the uh, former Lieutenant Governor of Ontario is writing about uh, uh, the suicides in Northern Ontario. And he was talking about how uh, young people make suicide packs and he was talking about, and he was trying to, it seemed to me in, a, in short order, he was trying to identify the rationale and the reasons behind it. And I think he hit on some of those things. So, so again, TRC, it's a good first step. But unless there's real education occurs, and unless the, the mainstream public is really intending to listen and hear the truth, I'm not sure how well affected it's going to be. Because right now we've got two situations in, in Indian country, or indigenous country. Mainstream society has been very effective in um, getting our people to believe they're Canadians, getting them to be assimilated, Get them to buy in to your system, or somebody's system anyway. Uh, and then there's others of us that say, uh, I was at a meeting last week and I said, what makes you think we want to be you? What makes we th you think we want to be you? Yeah, we got to live with you. We got to work beside you. Maybe we got to work for you, or maybe you got to work for us. But what makes you think you want to be you? I was born in 1946. I wasn't born a Canadian citizen. I was born a citizen of, my, citizen of my, uh, uh, the Oneida Nation. In, I think it was 1960, uh, when Diefenbaker was Prime Minister, they passed legislation that made us Canadians. Also give us the right to vote. And I think even more devastatingly uh, so on, on our social fabric, as they gave us the legal right to go into bars. And that was a horrific time. A horrific time. I think we're gradually coming out of that, but we we're going through a lot of pain. So anyway, I uh, I could go on and on, but uh, um, what we were talking about beforehand was, you know, we, we could talk a long time, but I have certain things I want to say, but I'm not sure that's what you want to hear. Uh, and I hope Margaret agrees with me. Uh, we, we want to open up the questions, you know, we'll do our best to answer your questions and, uh, and uh, we'll take it from there. So thank you very much. In Northern Ontario, it's my understanding that because of climate change that, and also because of modernization, that the indigenous people no longer can live the way they used to live off the land. And we hear about their wells being contaminated. And Kretchen suggested that groups of those communities be moved to a better area where there's more employment, I don't know whether it was better, but uh, to another area of Canada. What do you think about that? I was talking to an elder in uh, Thunder Bay about 30 years ago. 
Uh, and he was from one of the northern communities. And he was telling me that 30 years ago, they were seeing plants that never grew before in their area. They were seeing animals, our birds, that they never seen before. Uh, and he said the muskeg wasn't freezing solid uh, 30 years ago. So as it decreased, I would say it, it's accelerated. Um, I should have mentioned this. If you, you, know, you look at Europe, Europe is a much larger, a smaller land base than Canada. Yet it's very easy for you to discern and recognize there are different countries that speak different languages have some commonalities and belief systems, and at the same time, differences. Come to Canada, you've got 60 or 70 different First Nations or Indigenous nations. Um, and for the most part, those of us, and I speak a, a little bit of my language, um, those of, we can't understand each other. Uh, we have some commonalities in, say, our creation stories and some commonalities in our ceremonies. Well, you have some vast differences as well. So I can provide a comment on those communities up north, but I want to be clear that it's only my viewpoint, and I'm not sure I'm exactly right, and I certainly don't want to be some suggesting I'm speaking on behalf of those northern communities. I can only provide you a comment from that perspective. Uh, they, uh, up north, like all of us, uh, before the arrival of the European, we all had our own economies. Uh, we had our own ways of life. Um, to use Oneida's example, we were farmers. Uh, we had orchards. Uh, we hunted and gathered and we fished and so on, and we were traders. Um, we had pretty structured lives and we used to move every 25, 30 years when the land got depleted and we moved in our, in our territories. My understanding of northern folks uh, was that they, they didn't live in the large settings and they, they were fairly nomadic. And, and they, they moved around to follow uh, somewhat what we did too, the, that, the natural cycle. And, and once they got established and fixed and told they couldn't move through the land bases, they still attempted to, taunt, to hunt and fish and trap uh, according to their original lifestyles. but. I would say there's a couple of contributing factors that have limited that. One is climate change, but the other one is, is um, encroachment. And encroachment by the, the uh, non-indigenous folks, but encroachment through media. And what's happened is those northern folks uh, have really, uh, I would say, uh, seen a different lifestyle. So this is when Post pre World War II, the majority of people in Oneida were farmers. Post World War II, it was down to about uh, seven or eight. And today, we've got a couple of folks that farm, but they're very small tracks. So, what you've got, what you've had is it's external influence that's reduced uh, or eliminated the natural, natural way that people uh, live and support themselves. The other thing that has factored into it is the social fabric of all the indigenous nations has been torn badly. It's been ripped. It's been, it's been absolutely decimated. So where you had this natural fit, this natural teaching from one generation to another, uh, the residential schools and churches did a masterful job of eliminating that. And I didn't mention churches before, but uh, churches are, are absolutely not guilt-free on any of this stuff. They were the leaders of this, this, this things going on. So I would say that in northern communities, uh, they, uh, what's happened, I'll give you an example. Um, I had a meeting with, um, uh, several years ago, this, uh, there was a few of us uh, met with this drug and alcohol, alcohol counselor in and, um, and mid-central, maybe more northern Quebec. And he was working with youth. And the youth wanted to, um, uh, they wanted to go back to tradition. They wanted to find out who they were and, and get introduced to that. So they said to uh, uh, the, the counselor, we want, uh, we want to build a sweat. We want to experience the sweat laws. We want to know what that's about. We want to feel, we want to feel safe. Uh, so he, he constructed a sweat lodge and he started having sweats and the youth were were, um, as I understand, doing pretty well. 
Band council, all Christians, all drinkers, fired him and, and burnt uh, the, uh, the um, sweat lodge. And uh, he was telling us that uh, a few weeks later, a few of the chief and council were in Montreal, uh, pretty well tapped out after leaving the bar. So what you've got is this disconnect between the elders in communities, including mine, and the younger folks. And the disconnect is the, the older folks have been really conditioned to, to, to discount or reject their culture. And the younger folks are saying, who am I? Where do I fit? Where do I belong? And I think that's part of the, the, the challenge with the learning communities is that you've got this disconnect. Uh, it's not across the board, but a number of young folks, they feel there's no hope. Uh, and that's what uh, Bartholomew, or uh, well, the gentleman that wrote on that board, and that's what he was talking about. So I think there's a number of factors, and that's, uh, it's, and, and you, you say, well, we should move them. Well, um, if you look at all the communities in Canada, 633 communities, indigenous communities, I don't know the answer to this, but uh, my guess would be is that uh, none of them at our current location were there 300 years ago. We've all been moved. I'll give you an example of, of uh, Amjong or Chopo de Thames. At one point, they were all one community. And some people left and moved to Kettle Point, and some people left and went to Stony Point, and so other people moved to what's now Oil Springs. When they found oil, guess what happened? Those people got moved. And they ended up over at Chippewa the Thames. Uh, I don't know if you've been following news stories in the last few years, but Chippewa the Thames uh, settled land claims. And the land claims are based on the fact that they got forcibly removed from the land. So what's happened is, is uh, most times, uh, indigenous people have been placed in land that seems to be the least valued, uh, the least, uh, least uh, able to be developed. So it's a long answer to your question. I'm not sure if I answered it. I hope I touched on some of it. The Presbyterian Church in Canada is one of the signatories to the settlement agreement. And our congregations are being encouraged to uh, try to uh, have healing and reconciliation. Two years ago, I agreed to try to facilitate and lead some of that in my own congregation. And it's been a long, steep learning curve. Um, one of my, my major concern is the issues you've talked about, important as they are, are huge. And they're not something that I can do anything about. I can sign petitions. I can elect people into government or vote for people who support Indigenous matters. But can you give me some just suggestions? I did meet this morning, actually, on the Oneida Reserve with uh, a couple of people to talk about how we can start forming relationships. But do you have any suggestions for how the little guy in St. Thomas can work on healing and reconciliation with local First Nations? Uh, well, well, thank you for your, your work and your efforts. Uh, <clears throat> I wish I had this wand that uh, I could wave and everything would be okay. Um, I've had the opportunity to, to speak a, a few times at different different uh, forums and so on. And uh, I remember one time I was speaking at the university, and uh, I think it was following the Oka standoff. Uh, and, and I was uh, telling the students there uh, that uh, I said, you know, if, if you took the time to uh, meet indigenous people, uh, and really took the time to get to know them, I said, the chances are you'd find out that uh, they're pretty good people. Uh, so that, to me, is the first step, is, is to actually establish some kind of rapport or some kind of relationship. Um, short of that, I, I'm not... I, th I think when you, when you do that, then it starts... To, maybe it leads to, uh, you know, additional meetings, additional correspondence, additional uh, interaction. And it's easy for me to say this. Uh, it's a lot harder to do. 
It's really important to listen, but not just hear, to really listen. And I think that goes both ways. I know when uh, uh, I got, I, it's not my bio, but uh, when I was, uh, I was elected uh, as the elected chief in Oida in 1982, uh, I was there for 82 to 8 and from 90 to 94. And uh, I went through this period, uh, I, 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 was, I was green as grass, didn't know anything about anything. And uh, I started reading uh, things. I got tremendously angry at previous Oneida leadership and uh, why they allowed things to happen, why this happened, why they, why they didn't do anything about that. And um, what I came to realize, I, I don't know if it was a few months or a few years, I realized they did the best they could with what they had in front of them, the best that they were able to do. Um, and uh, move past that. I also got very angry at mainstream society, very angry, because when I grew up, my dad was a residential school survivor for seven years, and he was an excellent product at school. He never challenged the man. He worked hard, lived hard, drank hard. Uh, and he never, I don't recall him ever telling me anything anti-establishment. I don't recall that. My mother was hidden away by my grandma, so they wouldn't take her. So I grew up, as I was telling the uh, uh, lady before we started here, uh, I grew up in my community. I knew I was an Indian, but I didn't know I was an Aida because I didn't know what an Aida meant. Uh, and um, my part of the community, there was about seven or eight of us boys that used to play, and we used to play cowboys and Indians. None of us wanted to be the Indian. We all wanted to be the cowboy. So that's how masterful the job was done on us to convince us that uh, that outside society was the way to go. So, so for me, uh, uh, when, I, when, I, when I finally got to the point of being less angry, and it took me a lot longer to get over it, you know, we can talk about, uh, we can talk about things that happened in the past and can be mad for a long time. Uh, but I finally came to the point in my mind, I thought, well, somebody needs to go out there and talk, somebody needs to speak about these things. But at the same time, you can't change the past. What are you going to do going forward? And I think that's where you're at. What are you going to do going forward? And um, um, my, my, my thought would be is that uh, you continue to have the interactions, you continue to seek uh, information, and continue to have dialogue and, and to listen. And um, short of that, I'm not sure what else can be done because I agree with you. The issues are very large. Um, when I talked at the beginning about the Canada's Foundation is built on Dr. Discovery, that's the law. Is it going to ever change? I don't think so. Uh, I really don't. Uh, uh, I think there's going to be, I, I'm hoping, hopeful that there's going to be a bit of an acknowledgement uh, from government that uh, indigenous people uh, should be making their own decisions for them. But it still doesn't happen. I mean, it's, it, to me, it's just window dressing. Uh, and uh, like I say, when you sit down and negotiate and things like that, you always come to a point in time in negotiations, the answer is no. You can't do that. They don't quite say that directly, but they get around it. So. Again, a long answer to your question. I, I'd say, um, oh, I was going to mention to you, on Ida Reserve, it's, it's not, sure, not actually a reserve, it's on Ida Settlement. And I happen to be a little bit of a historian on that. And uh, there's 603 indigenous communities in Canada. There's only one that's totally unique, and that's on Ida. Uh, we hold our land outside the Indian Act without delegated authority. And we probate our own wills. Uh, we, we administer all over land transactions ourselves. And I was a lands administrator for several years. And um, so uh, that's part of, uh, to me, uh, I don't know. I don't know if we need to talk about it. Uh, but it's, it's, just, it's just part of the history that uh, Oneida is. So anyway. Yeah. Can I add just a, a little bit, Al, from, a, from my perspective in, in in answer to your question, some practical things. Like, for example, um, June was Indigenous Reads Month. And so, you know, participating and getting your congregation to participate in Indigenous Reads and to choose, um, you know, to read Indigenous literature. There's uh, amazing films that are available to show to your uh, congregation. 
Um, I think the important thing is not to put the burden on Indigenous people to tell you what to do to reconcile, is to figure it out and by trial and error and to participate um, in, in all that is available to us as non-Indigenous people to learn um, on our own, and, but also to have the conversations and to listen. So that's just a couple of practical things. I have a question for Margaret, and that's regarding living conditions and lack of uh, potable water in remote communities. What is our government doing to provide better living conditions and drinking water in the remote communities? Really good question. Um, and I just want to make clear, I, I don't work in, in the water area, so I don't have the, the details in hand. but. Um, there's a huge move afoot to uh, build uh, water treatment plants across the country and to make the existing water treatment plants on reserve workable. Um, there's been some really awful mistakes made in the past where you know, treatment plants have been built and then the proper training hasn't been provided to run a plant. It's a huge endeavor to run a water treatment plant. So there's a huge move afoot to get rid of the boil water advisories um, that INAC is working on with communities to do that. I don't have the exact numbers in my head, I'm sorry, but uh, there's a, a quite a few boil water advisories that are over now. There's um, um, in the billions of dollars of infrastructure dollars that have gone into uh, reserves to build things like water treatment plants and to build schools and to build uh, band offices um, over the last couple of years. There are, uh, at, today there are over uh, 100 boiler, boiler water advisories in, and, uh, in indigenous communities. Um, I was one of the uh, founders of the uh, Ontario First Nations Technical Services Corporation. Somebody said to me, how come you guys always come up with such long names? I said, I don't know. But they've been in operation for uh, 20, 22 years, and uh, they provide uh, engineering and technical ad advisory services to communities in Ontario. Um, I would say that uh, maybe part of the answer to your question is, uh, in the 1950s, um, uh, the government of Canada deliberately withheld infrastructure dollars from communities. Uh, and the, the goal was to, to make communities unattractive or unlivable so that people would move into urban centers. Uh, and in the United States, they approached it a little differently. They actually paid people to move from communities. Uh, but that was, that's what happened uh, as part of that. So the infrastructure, uh, uh, I don't know how well they were identified, but certainly the resources were deliberately withheld. Um, so the other factor that plays into it, though, too, is I think it's a it's it's changing, but there's a hangover from the residential school because I know I, I dealt with it myself uh, when I was going to high school. My father didn't care if I got an education; he literally didn't care. So you're not going to go to school, go to work. Uh, my mother uh, wanted me to get one, but uh, uh, once I got my grade 12, I ran away from school. I was gone. Um, uh, fortunately, that's changing today. So what you have in, in, in indigenous country today is uh, a shortfall in management, a shortfall in uh, assessing and running operations, whether it be the uh, administration office or, or whether running a treatment plant. Um, and. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, things that ha does happen, it's a reality, is, is that our, as our people go and get educated, uh, they don't always go back to the communities. In some cases, they've never lived in a the community. They've, their families moved in urban settings uh, and been two or three or four generations and have no desire to move back. So on one hand, there's lots of our folks that are getting educated. On the other hand, they don't always take the expertise back. So it would be easy for me to say, yeah, it's the government's fault and all this other stuff. Well, it's certainly a contributing factor, but it, uh, when, when Mark was talking about self-government, uh, I remember George Rasmus in 1987, uh, he was the National Chief, uh, George uh, knew him a bit. Uh, George gave this great speech and he said, self-government doesn't come without self-responsibility. So, you know, we as Indigenous people, um, 
we do a great job of uh, of uh, saying this and that and stuff like that. On the other hand, we need to start stepping up and taking responsibility. And that means we have to be in control of what goes on. And we always say that, but by being but actual control. So uh, I know there's been, uh, resources have been, have been put into communities. It's still, it's still lacking quite a bit. Uh, but it's always an ongoing challenge that, that it's like a, almost like a, a, a cheater board, you know, on one hand, the end of the resources, but then you have people that run it. Uh, my community, uh, the treatment plant was built in 1965 uh, when I was still going to high school. And uh, I, think, oh, I think I graduated that year, I can't remember. But anyway, it was built, but just as Margaret suggests, there was no training. There was nothing. So uh, I get in 82, and I, fortunately I, I knew a guy who worked for Indian Affairs. He, he was from Six Nations, and we got to be friends. And he said, uh, said to me, he said, we want to do an assessment on your operations. Uh, so we looked at it, and what he found was that we had no training, and we were over-treating the water. Uh, the water we were actually providing to a small segment of the community was, was fairly potable. Uh, so it, it took us uh, six years, uh, but we finally, we provide, uh, we have a central water distribution system, we have a full, uh, uh, fledged water plant, and um, I think we have uh, about 550 housing stock in our community. I believe about 99% of those are hooked into uh, to our to our water supply. So we provide a pot of water. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case across the board. Uh, so I don't want to sit here and complain about what Indian Affairs isn't doing because I think they're they're giving it their best shot. Uh, at the same time, as all governments do, you have to be mindful where you put the money. I mean, that's that's just reality. You know, it's nice to sit here and say, well, they should be doing this and doing that. Uh, but I think reality comes into play as well. And in the interest of time, this, it is 8.30, but I, do you want to ask? I have to leave really, really fast. Yeah. We can stay for a few more questions. We have to run. <laughs> is that okay? Yeah. I guess this is a quick question for the federal government. I, I, I'm not the federal government. Yeah, but, but I'm in, in trying to I'm understand. Not, I'm not Justin Trudeau. Yeah. I'm not Minister Bennett. I'm little old Margaret Buse from London. Oh. Yes. Not old, just. <laughs> <laughs> so I, it's a question for the government. Maybe you can help me understand it a little bit. It seems uh, to me from the outside looking in, um, on one hand, the government holds a, a, a politic and an optic about reconciliation, where we talk about listening and learning, and we talk about understanding the, our history and, and all these factors. I'm, I'm struggling with how that discussion of reconciliation affects how we talk about, and not just talk about, but how our government makes decisions when it comes to things like pipelines, uh, when it comes to things like land and water. Uh, is reconciliation just listening and learning? If, how far does listening and learning go if while we're talking about listening and learning, on the other hand, we're still building pipelines through people's land? It's a really excellent question. Um, and, and one that I think um, we struggle with and at the bureaucratic level as public servants because we are asked to go out and listen and to talk and to engage and to work in partnership. And then we prepare our best advice to the politicians and the politicians go behind closed doors in cabinet and they get advice from the Department of Finance, the Department of Justice, the Privy Council Office, the Prime Minister's Office and they make decisions and they're not necessarily uh, the best advice that we have been sent out to gather and to work in partnership. And um, the Canadian public is not behind that closed door, whether it's, it's the Indigenous um, uh, public or the non-Indigenous public, and that's the system that we live in. And so there is a disconnect. There's no question there's a disconnect. So when you get um, a really... Um, a difficult situation like Site C or the Trans Mountain, the TMX, the Trans Mountain um, pipeline, or um, something that has a, a huge impact on the environment, 
um, but also tremendous economic possibilities. First Nations feel that tug, uh, I shouldn't say First Nations, Indigenous people, because it's in the north with Inuit, it's, it's Métis, it's First Nations, feel that tug as well to say, you know, we don't want our land destroyed, and yet there are tremendous economic opportunities for our people to be engaged in this natural resource development. So how do we as stewards of land um, participate in um, the review of environmental assessments and the decisions around what, what should be developed and what should not. And most definitely in this country, we still are hewers of wood and drawers of water. And so we, we make enormous amounts of money in this, in this country by exploiting our natural resources. And we have done that on the backs of indigenous people for, for since we came to this land. Um, there's a huge effort now to include Indigenous people. So, for example, Natural Resources Canada um, is developing a pipeline monitoring system that is run by Indigenous people, with the full participation of Indigenous people to monitor how the pipeline is, is built, where it is built, and how it is functioning. Um, it's still being built. Trans Mountain is being built. but there's engagement. So um, I don't have a, more of an answer than that. It's a, a really difficult, complex situation to try and achieve some balance, but uh, it's essential that um, it not be done on the backs of Indigenous people any longer. I wrote to the um, Minister of Indian Affairs and I think it was 82 or 83, um, it was regarding um, a 300K uh, line that goes through our community, and I won't bore you the, the history in detail, nearly if we have the time to talk about it. But in my letter, I did say to the minister at the time, I, and it was uh, Monroe, I said, uh, why is it that most indigenous communities either have a uh, railway spur going through it, uh, why do they have a high voltage system going through it, or why do they have a highway uh, going through it, or they're adjacent to a landfill? And uh, of course, there, I got no answer on that part, uh, but my community, Oneida, we don't have a major highway going through it, although 401 and 402 are either side of us, but we do have a landfill right beside us. Uh, we did have a 300K going through, and we did have a railway, so I understand your point. And I think that's the, the dilemma. Uh, you know, if you don't have your traditional lifestyle of support, uh, what, what's the economic opportunity? So I think that's an issue that re that the communities themselves wrestle with. You know, do we respect Mother Earth? Do we we honor Mother Earth? Do we ensure that all living things have uh, uh, a chance to grow and prosper? I think we believe everything in Oneida. We believe uh, our way, traditional ways is that all things have a spirit, and certainly Mother Earth is a key part of that. And so, I don't know where the answer goes. Uh, you know where it is because. On one hand, uh, if you weren't to develop those things, what's the, where people can get jobs? Because one of the things you consistently hear is, uh, well, jobs, and they don't say taxes, but that's what they're really talking about, jobs, taxes, jobs, taxes. And, and, and Canada certainly is, does a, a pretty good job of, of uh, extending uh, programs to, to support uh, you know, lots of folks. Uh, I was, was going to call them, is it, well, is Canada considered like a social state, if you will? So it's got to be paid some way. So I don't know what the answer is. Uh, I guess it'd uh, be nice to think that there'd never be an oil spill. One last thing. My community, uh, we had an opportunity. That we were told in geological literature terms, we had stood an excellent chance that we were either sitting on gas or oil deposits. So I was like the chief at the time. So uh, we had the uh, land stake. We are going to have um, a seismic testing done. And uh, the guys that we had hired out of Alberta uh, came to my office and said, um, we were told to leave the community. Oh, okay, so we'll describe them. So I knew what they were talking about. So I go meet with the chiefs, uh, traditional chiefs, and we still have a traditional council, and that's where I sit now. Another fascinating story. Anyway, I go there and I thought, I'm all set, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I got the answers here. So I go there and I say, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're going to build berms. We're going to make sure here we're, we're going we're gonna to actually bring in some uh, resource development. We're going to bring some money and probably jobs. They asked me two questions. They said, um, is this a, is a renewable resource? No. Uh, 
Is there a chance for a spill? Yes. Then no. So the chiefs said no, and we didn't do it. Okay, well, this was pretty powerful. Um, obviously, we could, we could have dedicated two hours to your talk today, and I'm sorry, in the interest of time, we do have to wrap things up. I want to thank everyone for coming again today. It's clear to us that you guys are engaged in this topic, and I do believe that collectively we do have the power to shape uh, this reconciliation, truth and reconciliation journey, and going beyond just the talk, right? Um, I would also love to thank the Muse Museum London for partnering with London Community Foundation, allowing us this platform to host our speaker series for the past four weeks and to house the witness blanket. So thank you to everyone and uh, for Chuck back there for always making sure that the technical side of things is always working well and Anita as well. I don't think she's in the room anymore, but thank you. Um, I would also like to give a gift to our speakers. Uh, Al, and to Margaret, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And this concludes everything.